Hello there. In this video, we're going to derive Gauss's law from Coulomb's law using the notion of solid angles. So first off, what is a solid angle? We can think of solid angles as the 3D version of the typical angles that we're used to working with with planar geometry. And so similarly to how we define the notion of angles using arcs and circles, we can define solid angles using spheres and spherical patches. So let's go ahead and consider a spherical shell of radius r, and let's imagine there's a patch of some area a on that shell. Then the solid angle subtended by that patch is defined as the area of the patch divided by r squared. This definition makes sense, right? Just like how with a circle, you could define the angle subtended by an arc by taking the arc length divided by r. But now, because we're dealing with areas, our normalization factor, if you will, has to be of the form 1 over r squared. So to make sure we're totally on the same page here, let's do a quick example. Let's find the solid angle subtended by any closed spherical shell of radius r. Well, we know the formula for the surface area of a sphere, that's just going to be 4 pi r squared, and then we go through and we divide by r squared, and we're going to be left with a solid angle of 4 pi. And by the way, the units of solid angles are called stair radians, and they're abbreviated SR. Now, solid angles, analogous to our planar angles, can be defined for non-spherical surfaces as well. Consider I have an arbitrarily shaped shell, which I'm going to call my blob. I'm going to go ahead and put an origin somewhere within the blob. The exact location doesn't matter. Now, we can think of this blob as being made up of a bunch of infinitesimal surface area patches ds. And from my origin, I'm going to point to each of those patches with a position vector r. Now, in order to track the direction of these infinitesimal surface patches, we use this unit vector n hat, which is going to be perpendicular to the patch and point outwards, away from the surface. Okay, and in the direction of this r vector, I'm going to define a unit vector r hat. So now the problem in front of us is we have to figure out the infinitesimal solid angle element d omega subtended by this patch ds. In order to do that, we have a little two-step program. In our mind, I want us to imagine that we can create a sphere using this position vector r. And there's going to be some contribution of this ds patch that points along the surface of that sphere. We first need to find that contribution by projecting the ds patch onto this sphere of radius r. And then, once we've done that, we simply divide through by r squared. So in order to complete step one, we're going to use a dot product. If I define a vector ds n hat, and I dot it in the r hat direction, then that is going to project the ds n hat vector onto the r hat unit vector. And that's exactly what we want. We're using the overlap of these two vectors to tell us the effective area of ds when projected onto the spherical surface of radius r. And now step two, we just divide by r squared. And here we go. We have a nice expression here for how to define an infinitesimal solid angle for a non-spherical surface patch. I'm going to box this result. If we understand this procedure, the other thing that should be absolutely clear now is that the total solid angle subtended by any closed surface is always going to be equal to 4 pi. Because by repeating this process over and over again for every single patch on your blob, you're going to be building up the surface of a unit sphere. And earlier we showed that the solid angle subtended by a closed sphere is going to be 4 pi. This is a natural conclusion, by the way. 
It's just like how with angles, we know that a closed loop, regardless of its shape, is going to subtend an angle of 2 pi. Now we've shown a similar result for our solid angles. If we're feeling great about these two results, then proving Gauss's law is super duper easy. Imagine that I have an arbitrary closed surface S, and I put a charge Q inside of that surface. We want to find the expression for the electric flux through our surface S. Or in other words, how much do the electric field lines produced by Q push either out or in on the surface? We can once again break this surface down into a bunch of DS patches each with an n hat unit vector, and again we can point to each of these ds patches with a position vector r and define an r hat unit vector. So first let's determine the amount of flux through one of these patches. We know that the electric field produced by this charge is going to follow Coulomb's law. So at the patch that's going to look like 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught times q over r squared in the r hat direction. And then to find how much of that electric field is actually pushing on this patch, we have to dot it with the ds n hat vector. And if we want to find the total flux through our surface S, we have to integrate this infinitesimal flux across our entire surface. But look how quickly we're going to be able to simplify this down because of our expressions that we have boxed on the left. Let me pull our constants out of this integral and emphasize that everything in purple here is just how we defined an infinitesimal solid angle d omega. And next, we're going to use our fact that we already showed before, which is that the solid angle subtended by any closed surface is always going to be equal to 4 pi. And just like that, we've shown that for any surface enclosing a charge, regardless of its shape, the flux through that surface is always going to be equal to q over epsilon naught. And then we can generalize this for multiple charges enclosed by a surface by using the superposition principle. You can simply add the contribution from each charge together. And so we come up with this nice version of Gauss's law here that the electric flux through our surface is going to be equal to q enclosed over epsilon naught, where q enclosed is defined as the total charge inside of the surface S. We've shown Gauss's law to be true in the case of electrostatics, where these charges are stationary. It'll be interesting to note if this law still holds in non-static scenarios. But anyways, I'm going to go ahead and end this video here. If you enjoyed this video, found it helpful, let me know in the comments and consider subscribing to the channel. I love to hear about people getting on board. But other than that, thank you so, so much for watching.